Hello, welcome to Numerical. We are continuing our series on predicting baseball games. So in the last video, we we showed how to get some data and to process it to get some team level statistics. And now in this video, we're going to take that data and do some exploration and build our first model. So that should be pretty interesting. Um, a couple things I wanted to say though ahead of time. First of all, all the notebooks uh, that you'll need to follow along are in my GitHub repo, and I'll have a link for that in the description below. So if you just look in the description, you'll, you'll find your way. And that's great if you want to follow along with the notebook and play around yourself. Uh, second, again, hate to nag, but it would be great if you could like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, it helps me out a lot. And uh, with that said, let's get into our notebook. So again, last time we loaded the data in from RetroSheet, uh, and did some processing and we got team level statistics. So for every game, we we're able to say what's been the, the sort of on base percentage of that team over the past 162 games over the past 30 games and the same for their slugging percentage over the last 162 games and 30 games. And we save that data to a file called dfbp1.csv. And so now in this notebook, we're going to load in the data we used from last time. We're going to explore the data a little bit. And then we're going to build and evaluate our first predictive model and see how well we are able to predict these games just using some, some basic team hitting statistics. Okay, so moving through the notebook, we're going to use some packages here. So please install these packages if you don't have them already. And then we load in our data. And we're just going to, again, check through the columns and see uh, if there appear to be any problems, you see we've got 96,276 rows. And they're mostly populated a few nulls that come from uh, the fact that for the first 30 or 162 games, we may not have uh, the trailing average because we don't have enough history. But I'm going to take this opportunity now to... to show you some of the exploration that I would typically do if I was faced with this data for the first time. Now, data exploration is a tricky thing because ideally you want to get all your exploration out of the way at the beginning. You want to find all the, all the problems, check each column, understand it completely before you move forward. That would be the ideal, but it's really hard to do in practice, right? People are sort of impatient. You don't really know the context of these variables. So it's hard to find all the problems right ahead of time. So if you're working on a data set, a data set you're going to be working with for a long time and you really want to build up an understanding of it, a good thing to do is just try to poke around a little bit periodically and, and keep going back to it and find a column that you haven't really analyzed too much and look through it and try to understand it and try to ask questions and, and see if, if there are any things you don't understand about what that column means or if there are any particular values in that column that don't make sense or that you don't understand why they would be that way. So to start sort of poking around and testing this data and building our understanding of it, first thing I do is just look at, look at the seasons. So this is how many rows we have uh, per season. And so you see 1980, we had 2,100 games. 1981, we had less, so that I believe that was a strike year for baseball, so that makes sense that we have less. And then otherwise, we, were, we had 2,100, give or take a few. Now remember, there might be extra games here for a few reasons, and we'll get into some of that late, later, but uh, it, it makes sense that this varies a little bit. Then you see again, 1994, we had fewer because of uh, that was another strike year. Um, and then we see the number jumps, and I think this is because of expansion. So they added more teams to Major League Baseball, so there were more games to be played because you had a couple extra teams. And then it stayed consistent around that number, and then 2020, because of the pandemic, we again had a, a drop in the number of games. But it's good to look through something like this, see that it all makes sense, make sure you don't have any gaps in your data, or there's some issue, especially when you're working with a data source that you know, you're not sure how reliable it is. Okay, next let's just look at the home victory mean again. So we looked at this last time. So again, we see that uh, 53.836 roughly, you know, percentage of the time the home team wins. So the home team has a slight edge. 
Um, now, one thing I want to check, though, is uh, when I built this column, home victory, I looked at this run. I made the run differential, so the runs of the home team minus the runs of the visiting team. And I said, if it's bigger than zero, the home team wins. And one thing I didn't check for is, uh, could there be a zero? Now, you might say zero. How could you have a run differential of zero? It's baseball. There are no ties in baseball. But it can happen. And here's where it could happen. It could happen if you have a game that goes at least five innings and then it's tied and there's a rain delay. So that then counts as an official game. Those statistics count towards the players, but they don't put it in the standings. And that appears to be it. So that's a, a question you might want to ask your data. Oh, are they including those games? Are they including rain delay ties that are official games? Now, again, this is a rare situation. It looks like there's only 35 of them since 1980. But th this is a case where you might have made an assumption about your data set, about the columns in your data set, that proves not to be true. So these are the kinds of things when I talk about interrogating data. These are the things you want to look at. I made an assumption when I created this home victory column that you would not have a run differential of zero. And... It turns out I was wrong. You can have to, we have 35 games here, which are ties. So now we can decide what to do with it. Do we want to just drop those 35? Um, do we want to handle them some other way? But it's important that, you know, it's probably important to say, hey, these were not actually losses by the home team. We should probably differentiate that. Um, so anyway, I, I thought I thought that was interesting to, to come through, and it just shows you how. This is a case where, again, domain expertise also helps. This is your way of sort of testing what you think is true based on your domain expertise as to what really is true. Another interesting thing to look at that they include is the total number of outs. So what's going on here? Well, you might think it's a nine inning game. There's three outs per team and there's the home and the visiting. So there should be six outs per inning, the top half and the bottom half, and the nine innings should be 54. But you actually see that 51 is actually the most common. So why is 51 more common than 54? Well, 51 happens, when does 51 happen? When the home team is leading, going into the bottom of the ninth, they don't bother to play the bottom of the ninth inning. So you actually end up only recording 51 outs for that game. So that's kind of interesting also, and it makes sense now because the home team wins a little bit more than the visiting team. And when the home team wins most of the time, they'll be leading by the before the, the bottom half of the ninth inning. There might be some games where they win it in the bottom of the ninth or it's tied or so forth. But I thought that was an interesting observation that, that actually the most common number of outs per game is actually 51. And you see then 54 is the second most. The third most is 60, so that means it was a 10 inning game. And then you've also got 53 and 52. So these are interesting also, right? So um, 52 and 53 probably means that the home team was either tied or losing going into the bottom of the ninth and then they won the game in the bottom of the ninth. So they either had zero outs. If they had zero outs, that would actually be under this 51. If they had one out, it would be 52. And if they had two outs when they scored the winning run, it would be 53. So that, that's what I'm guessing is happening in these situations. But again, here's a good opportunity to, to test. Are, are we right? Am I right in that analysis? So how can I check? Let's look. A quick way to check is just to say, when the out total is 53, does that mean the home team always won? Because that's my assumption. So I'm going to just look at home victory for the cases where the out total is 53. I'm just going to take the mean. If the mean is 1, I know they're all 1s. So I get 0.9994577. So it looks like it's almost always a home victory, but there's at least you know one or two maybe things exceptions. So let's look at those exceptions. And this is the nice thing about data is you can drill in. And this is something I always encourage people to do when they're trying to understand your data 
is to look at individual cases, find cases with interesting properties, look at them and see what happened. So if we look at this game, let's look for games where the out total was 53, but the home team did not win. And you see, there's only one game since 1980. And it's this game on September 15th, 2005, between St. Louis and Chicago. Uh, and I actually, I dug into the details. And if you see, this game was 6-1. And actually, what happened in this game was... Uh, the visiting team, St. Louis, was ahead going into the ninth. Uh, the home team, Chicago, uh, it was actually 6 nothing going into the bottom of the ninth. Chicago hit a home run, got some runners on base, got a couple of outs, and then it started raining. So after 30 minutes or an hour, I forget what it was, then they called the game. So this is, again, sort of very rare situation, but a good thing to know that this could happen in your data. So there can be these very rare situations where the out total is 53. It doesn't necessarily mean that the home team won. The vast, vast, vast majority are. But again, I, I, I really like digging into these details because you could find these interesting stories and these interesting situations um, that, that break assumptions you have about your data. And this happens all the time. And, and if you're working in data, I think it's really important to understand those assumptions because you might have written code or built models or done lots of things that made certain assumptions. And it's good to know where those assumptions don't hold true. Um, another thing I want to look at is this game number for the home team. So in, in our data frame, they have the game number, which is, is it the first game? Is it the second game of the year? So forth for the team. And let's look at the, we'll do a value counts on that and sort by index. So you see the first game, so forth, second game, we get a lot of numbers up to 162. And I'm curious is, does it go beyond 162? And you see it does. You sometimes have a 163 and a 164. And so, What's going on with those? And the, the first thing I thought of when I saw this is, oh, well, sometimes they have a one game playoff. If two teams are tied, they have a one game playoff and that counts as a regular season game. Um, but actually what most of these are is not that situation. What most of these are, are these uh, rain delayed games uh, that ended in ties. So, if you had a rain delay game that ended in a tie, what I think happens is they count as an official game, but they still try to make up the game. Okay, so the, the moral of the story I wanna say is, it's good to interrogate your data, ask questions, try to make some hypotheses about what a data value might mean or how a certain situation could occur, and then dig in the details to either confirm them or disprove them. And knowing these things about your data will really help you to avoid mistakes, especially when you're dealing with complicated data sets or mixing different data sources. It's really important uh, to get that right and to know as much about your data. But enough of the data exploration. Uh, let's get into the modeling. I think that's what everyone's excited about is how well can we predict these games right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop those ties because they don't really count as a victory or a, a loss for the home team. And there's only 35 of them, so let's just drop them. And now we're gonna we're gonna start building our model. And the way I'm gonna do this is to uh, I'm gonna train on the seasons from 1981 to 2018, and then I'm gonna create a validation set using seasons 2019 and 2020. And then for our test data, we're gonna just use. Uh, 2021 and 2022. And to start out, let's just let's just pick the on-base percentage for the two teams, average over the last 162 games, and the slugging percentage. So let's start with something very simple and just see how much insight does this give us into those games. So this is our features and this is our target. And so now we can define our X trains and Y trains. For the X trains, we're gonna pick out the columns corresponding to the features. 
For the Y trains, we're just going to take the single target, convert it to a NumPy array for simplicity. So we've got 85,000 in our training set, 3,000 in our validation set, and 4,800 in our test set. And again, this is realistic. Why do I not just average all the game, uh, you know, randomly sample? Well, because we, we want to understand how well can we predict the future given the past, right? This is a more realistic scenario. So in this scenario, we can really pretend, suppose we did this work back in, uh, you know, back at, before the 2021 season and developed this model, how well would we, would we have done using this model for the 2021 and 2022 seasons? So next, let's look at let's look at a couple of these features. So now a couple of things about histograms. So, so if you look at histograms, typically you'll do something like this. You'll just take a histogram of it. And you'll get something very, very blocky. And so I always recommend, I like histograms a lot. I think they're very useful to, to see what's going on. But I strongly recommend when you make your histograms to make your own endpoints. So do the first one. And now I can see, okay, everything's between... 0.28 and 0.38 for to make it easy I just go between 0.25 and 4 and I put 150 bins so you have to add one because you have one more endpoint than bin and this way I've got a bin per, per sort of one bin for 250 one bin for 251 one bin for 252 and so forth and now you see a little more detail and you see a little more interesting and you, you get a better a better sense of the shape. So uh, in general, the default histogram is going to be very coarse. And so I recommend, especially when you've got bigger data, to pick your own bin points and make them very fine. And so you see that we're uh, typical on base percentage is around 33%, 0.33. And, you know, tails off over here. There's this sort of bump over here, which is kind of interesting. So whereas on the left side, it, 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 it goes down sort of more smoothly on the right side you get this little shoulder around 0.36 so something to be aware of I don't know what causes that um, so this is for the visiting team now if you look at the home team uh, you'll see it's essentially the same shape right and, and we would expect that and similarly we can look at slugging percentage so I've already taken the trouble to sort of make the bins a little more uh, granular and we see that slugging percentage is, you know, probably typical is around 400, maybe a little more. Um, now, another reason why I like to look at these histograms is this tells you, um, you know, the range of values where you have a lot of data and the range of values where you might not have that much data. And this will be important when, when we analyze our model uh, later in this lesson, because we'll want to know where is the model reliable because it really has a lot of data to learn from and where is it maybe less reliable because there aren't that many examples. So in this lesson, we're, to start with, we're going to use uh, LightGBM. So this is there's many boosting packages. We're going to play around with a few different ones. But to start, we'll use LightGBM. It's a pretty nice one. It's pretty fast. Um, and the way I like to do boosting models and the way I, I strongly recommend is to use early stopping. So don't try to guess what number of estimators and what learning rate to use. Just pick a relatively low learning rate. So I usually start with like 0.02. I pick a high number of estimators and I crank it up more if I need to. I'll start with max depth equals three. This is, this is something I'll, I will tune later. Um, but then what you do is when you fit the model, you use a validation set. And what this says is LightGBM just, just changed how they, the sort of nomenclature for this. So now they want you to do everything via callbacks. So you have a callback that says, if I've gone 50 rounds, so I've built 50 more trees in my boosting model, and I haven't hit a new low in the last 50 rounds, then stop. And it's going to judge it by the performance on this evaluation set. And what this does is, is it eliminates two very crucial parameters from your grid search or whatever hyperparameter optimization you're doing. Because you just say, hey, my learning rate's low enough that I know I didn't go too fast. And I trained it until this validation set stopped improving. And so that's pretty good evidence that that's a good place to stop. 
So let's do that. We train our model. You see this runs very, very fast. If we scroll down, we see that our validation log loss went down until here. And then, uh, and then we stopped improving. So we never hit a low here again. And you see, in fact, there's a slightly better low. Oh, actually, there's a better low. It looks like in between 180 and 190, we hit a low of 0 0.6806. And again, the goal of this is not that there to be something exact. Uh, you know, it's whether you stopped at 170 or stopped at 182, that's usually not going to make a huge difference. So now we're going to get our predictions. So I'm going to use predict proba and uh, get my probabilities. And I take the I take colon one because I want the probability of, of one, the probability of the home victory. And let's look at our log loss on the test set. And we get this number 0 0.68299. And it's hard to know, was that good? Is that bad? What does that mean? So one benchmark that's always useful to compare it to is the naive prediction, right? You want to make sure you're doing better than the naive prediction. So in this case, what is a naive prediction? Naive prediction would be just take that home victory. Suppose we predicted 53% for everyone, 53.83. So if I didn't know anything about the teams and you gave me a data point and said, what's the probability that the home team won? I would say, well, I don't know anything, but I know the home team wins 53.83% of the time. So I'll guess 53.83 because I can't do any better than that. I don't know anything else. And what this is saying is, okay, when we use the predictions in this model, we're able to do a little bit better. We're able to get to 0.683 versus we would have gotten 0.69 uh, using just an naive prediction. So this is a good sanity check. You're doing better than some benchmark. And again, this is a process I think that's really important to follow whenever you're building models is have something relatively simple or have some established benchmark where you say, I know I can get this performance doing this process, and now can I do better? Um, so this is what we get. So we're getting a little bit of improvement. And another thing to think about is, you know, this is not, you may have worked on other problems where your log loss gets a lot lower and said, wow, this, this barely budged. And one thing to remember is that th this is what I would call a low signal problem we do not expect to have probabilities close to one and zero for any of these. We're never absolutely sure a particular team is going to win or we're absolutely sure they're going to lose. This is not the kind of thing, uh, the kind of problem like, you know, doing image classification on dogs versus cats, where you can say confidently, this is a dog, this is a cat, and they're going to be right 99.9% .9 of the time. This is a different regime. This is where maybe we get to 60-40, you know, or maybe 65-35 those kinds of probabilities. And, and we'll see what those probabilities look like in just a second. Okay, next what I want to do is I'm going to use the ML Insights package, and this is actually a package I developed, uh, to look at the model and how the model behaves. So we're going to do what's called an ice plot. And I'll explain a little bit how these work. How these work is each of these lines represents a particular data point in our test set. And the dot represents what the true value of the variable was here. So right now we're looking at the on-base percentage uh, of the home team over the last 162 games. And this top line is a particular game where the on-base percentage of the home team was about 32 point something percent. And what these lines tell us is what kind of prediction would the model make if I change that value? So right now, the home team had a 32% on-base percentage, and they won about 60% of the time, or the, rather, I should say, the model predicts that they'll win about 60% of the time. And what this says is the model kind of gives a small increase up until you hit about you know, 0 0.342 maybe, and then it shoots up. Now again, this is what the model thinks. This is how the model works. So this gives you some insight as to what your model is doing and what kinds of predictions it's making. So what should we do with this? Well, first things you want to do with this is just some basic sanity checks, right? 
as the home team hits better, are they more likely to win? Well, yes, as they have a higher on-base percentage, they're more likely to win. So that's good. It's generally sloping the direction we want. Similarly, for the on-base percentage for the visiting team, we have the opposite effect. As the visiting team has a higher on-base percentage, the home team is less likely to win, which is what you would expect. And similarly for slugging, as slugging gets better, the home team for the home team, they're more likely to win. As slugging gets better for the visiting team, they're, uh, the home team is less likely to win. The other thing you could do with these plots, though, is, you know, get some insight as to what your model is doing. And often you'll be very surprised as to what your model is actually doing. So what are some surprising things here? Well, it's bumpy, even with 85,000 data points and relatively few variables. Another thing that these ice plots will tell you is how much interactivity there is between your variables. So if there's no interactions between the variables, you'd expect the shapes of these lines to be exactly the same. And we kind of see that in these top two lines here, right? In these top two lines, they have really a very, very similar shape. So for these top two lines, at least, maybe the, the other variables were all the same or very similar. But in general, and you, you could plot, I plotted three here, right? But you could plot more and look. And, and the general story is, if you see vastly different patterns for these lines, that's an indication that uh, there's interactions between your variables. So that means how my model prediction changes with respect to this variable depends on what those other variables are. So if you see wildly different things, then you know that, oh, there's a lot of interactivity here. Um, if you see the exact same pattern for all the variables, then you know, hey, there's really no interaction. It's really kind of like almost an additive model. Okay, so this is, I think these are really useful, really underused tools in modeling. And we're going to talk a little bit more about them uh, going forward. But I want to move on right now to another kind of plot that I really like, which is a reliability diagram. So these are a measure of calibration. So in this problem, we really care about getting precise probabilities. We really want to be able to say for a particular game, can I confidently say this team is going to win 62% of the time? So if we look at this plot, let's start on the right-hand side. This is a histogram of our predicted, predicted probabilities. And you can see there, you've got the biggest peak between 0.5 and 0.55, between 50 and 55%. So that makes sense, right? Because we said the average, on average, the home team wins about 54% of the time. So you would expect that to be the most common. So if we we're just doing a naive, that naive model where we just guess that 53.6 all the time, you would just get one big bar here, right? And, and we would be probably pretty close to perfectly calibrated. But what's our model doing? Our model is saying, well, they're not all 53%. Some games are more, some games are less for the home team. And you see our spread is not huge here. Our model is not ever going out on a limb and saying this team's going to win 80% of the time or this team's going to, you know, uh, only win 30% of the time. Almost all the scores are between 0.45 and 0.65. And you've got a few between 0.4 and 0.45 and a few between 65 and 70. So, so again, this is what you'd expect because we don't have that much information. So we're only able to adjust things a little bit. Now, if we know that an ace picture is starting for a particular team that for that particular game, we might expect to have a more extreme prediction, but we don't have that information in the model yet. Okay, so let's move to the left side of this. We have a reliability diagram. What's going on here? Well, here we're seeing in the games where I predicted between 0.5 and 0.55, did that, did that bear out? Did we actually get about you know 53 percent of the time wins when the average probabilities in that bin were 53 and a half and the way to read this is on the line means you're perfectly 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 calibrated but you shouldn't expect that right even if you flip if you flip 
a totally fair coin a thousand times, you are not going to get exactly 500 heads and exactly 500 tails, right? Just by random chance. It's very unlikely you'd be perfect. But you should be pretty close. So these error bars give you what you should expect based on how many observations you have in the bin on the right. So you can see for the, the leftmost and rightmost bars, we have very wide error bars because there's very few observations in the corresponding bins. And for the middle four, we have tighter bars, and you know the, the middle two in particular are even tighter. And what we see here is that all the dots are within the error bars. They're all roughly, you know, they're all in the range of what we would expect uh, to see if this was well calibrated. So this is kind of like a hypothesis test kind of view where you say, assuming that it's well calibrated, do I see anything that would cause me to reject the null hypothesis? And essentially what we're seeing here is, yeah, there's nothing in here that makes me think that, uh, that this thing is not well calibrated. Okay, I want to, well, before I move on to that, let me just back up a second and say, let's say I changed my max depth here to, uh, let's say I increased it to four and did this analysis again. So you see that our, our log loss barely changed. It went from 68299 to 68308. So it's really the, basically the same value uh, up, up to, you know, almost four decimal places. Um, but now let's look at our, our uh, ice plots. And we see actually quite a bit different behavior, right? This is spiking even a lot more, right? So even though the average results were the same, this model is going to behave quite a bit differently. And, uh, you know, when you see things like this, you might start to feel like, hey, I, I don't really like this model anymore, right? It's jumping around in weird places. And um, again, you won't know this if you don't look. And you won't even know it from your, your log loss value because they had about the same log loss value. But, you know, would you really want to take this model to the bank and, and say that, you know, uh, there's this huge dip here, you know, there's a, a, a dip uh, between these values where, where the, the uh, curve goes down and then back up. This looks very erratic. And this is something that ice plots help you uh, notice. Now let's do it again and change it to max depth of two. Let that go. So now again, almost the same value is four and almost the same value is three. But you see, now these curves look a lot smoother, right? Because it's not doing, because the depth is less, it's, it's doing less kind of overfitting. Um, and these curves look a little more smooth. Another thing to point out is when you're looking at these curves, you want to keep in mind what's the range of values you expect to see. So remember we did these histograms up here. And, you know, you'll see that right between sort of less than 0.28 for on base percentage, we barely have any data. But even between 0.28 and 0.3, we've got relatively little data. So we might expect to see more erratic behavior in the areas where there's less data. So if you're looking for, hey, did my model really capture the signal well, you want to sort of focus on the, the range of values where you have a lot of data. So it's one thing with ice plots to always keep in mind is these ice plots are telling you what your model thinks, which may or may not be a good judge of reality. And uh, so, you know, you'll often see these erratic, uh, erratic, behavior at the end uh, on the endpoints. So for example, here you see on, on base percentage for 162 home, you see this big jump at 0.35, right? But if we look up, kind of see 0.35, I'm already kind of running out of data. So maybe, maybe you know, I, I don't trust that as much as I might trust uh, other, other things as, as much as I might trust the behavior. 
sort of between 0.32 and 0.34. Okay. One last thing I want to show you is uh, the structure boost data package. So again, this is a package I've come up with. And I just want to highlight one aspect of it, which is, um, so it's a little slower. So I'm going to use a little time warp to get you to the end of this quickly. And if we look at structure boost, you see we get almost again, the same 0.683 value that we, we've seen for the light GBM model. So it's getting about the same performance of log loss. Um, we can look at its reliability diagram and similarly, similar behavior, similar uh, range of predictions and similarly well calibrated. Um, now, if we look at our ice plots, we see the curves are a little smoother. And this is a function of uh, a feature that I added to structure boost. So, so if you look at um, if you look at these, you see they're very square. They're sort of flat and square and flat and square. And a lot of this comes from when, when they choose points to say decision points on the decision tree and you say from the left, you know, if you're bigger than this value, go this way. If you're less than this value, go this way. One of the challenges is you're using only the values that you've seen. And so, for example, imagine a problem where you either see values less than or equal to five or greater than or equal to six. What should you do between five and six? And what I believe Light GBM essentially does is it says, well, let's pick like five and a half or, or five or six, but it basically makes a hard step somewhere in the middle there. So it says we have no data. With structure boost, I did this little trick where I said to figure out my decision points to evaluate in the gaps between the values that I've seen, I sort of randomly picked a value in between uniformly. So that over time, it would kind of average out those points in between. And the result is that you get these smoother curves. So again, this doesn't always show up in things like the log loss score. But I think if you look at these curves, you'll say, okay, these are a little bit more coherent. You've still got some weird behaviors, especially where you have less data. But, you know, I would argue these curves look a little smoother. And that's a, something that I tried to do in the structure boost package. So we've got a model. We've got some measures. We know it's doing better than nothing. But is, it, is this good enough to bet on? You know, is this, is this a good model? Can we, can we outwit Las Vegas using this? Well, to do that analysis, we need to have the Las Vegas odds on these games to know whether our probabilities were doing better than those probabilities. So in the next lesson, we're going to get some of that odds data, and then we'll be able to, to do that analysis. So again, we're going to pretend that we're, we're trying to beat Las Vegas. We're trying to build a model that beats it. Right now, we know we're beating the most naive prediction of all, but we don't really know if we're doing if we're anywhere close to to beating Las Vegas odds. So in the next lesson, we'll get the Las Vegas odds. We'll start doing some head-to-head -head comparisons, and then we'll start uh, figuring out what to do next to improve our model.